Whenever a gaming YouTuber I like hosts a Q&A, one of my personal favorite questions to ask is this. What is a game you would love to do a playthrough of on your channel, but feel like you couldn't for one reason or another? I find it to be such a powerful question because it's so open-ended. The barriers to actually play and cover some of our favorite games are lower than ever, so what could possibly be a factor in why we couldn't? Maybe it's a monetary or exclusivity thing, as equipment we would need to actually play said game is too old or too rare to be viable. Maybe it's an accessibility thing, as in we couldn't physically play a game, or play it in such a way we think would be entertaining to watch. Maybe it's a morality thing, as in we might enjoy something in isolation, but might not feel comfortable promoting it in an, to our audience in an uncritical way. Maybe it's a difficulty thing, in that the game is just way too hard for us to play beginning to end reliably. Maybe it's a legal or TOS thing too, and hearing people's insight into what they would have liked to play if these factors weren't a variable is kind of telling in a very personal way. I find it to be a very good question for those types of like Q&A sessions. A game I have always felt this way about is Lethal Enforcers 2 Gunfighters, a 1994 light gun game for the arcades created by Konami. My family occasionally went to a campground as a kid, and one thing they had there was this pool hall with a number of arcade games in the corner of the room. I spent hours here as a kid. Every half a year or so they would rotate in and out new games, but my personal favorite was always this one, a quaint rail shooter where you take down bandits in the Wild West. I'm gonna be honest, the reason this one stuck out to me and took up most of my time was probably because of a hardware malfunction with the machine that essentially gave you free plays and infinite lives. I think a quarter was stuck in one of its coin slots which led to that. I don't know if the adults who ran the campground were aware of what was essentially a broken machine, but rest assured me and my friends took full advantage of the opportunity to play it over and over again. I remember at one point I got so good at this game that I functionally could beat it in one credit. Like I could ever test that though, because you know, you had infinite credits. <laughs> now, as for why I could never let's play this, well, mostly because of the hardware. Like seriously, while a lot of arcade experiences can be ported nowadays, light gun games are a little trickier. The machine had a physical plastic gun built into it that you played with, and while you could theoretically play it with a mouse, it just wouldn't be the same, you know? By the way, for this reason, all gameplay I'm going to be using in this video is from existing long play footage on YouTube. And here's whose footage I'll be using, just to give proper credit. While I could probably never let's play this game in a way that would make me happy, I've still always wanted to talk about it on the channel. It's a nostalgic game for me, and there's actually quite a bit of interesting trivia behind it that I've never seen compiled all in one place before, probably due to the game's obscurity. Well, here we go. While idle but not being played, the game goes through a number of demo footages, however occasionally it cuts to an actual intro. The game takes place in 1973, outlaws exist, and that's the most story you're gonna get from this game. Yeah, it's a rail shooter, they're solely focused on delivering good gameplay here as opposed to like anything narrative related. I did some digging and apparently the instruction manual for the Genesis version has a tiny bit more, but it's literally a paragraph long. It mentions that you play as this old American town's two new sheriffs, cause this game does have two player co-op, and you have your work cut out for you as around these parts, law and order are dirty words. Also apparently the gun you use is called the Justifier, which is really funny to me. We'll talk more about the Genesis version later though. Can you survive the Wild West? Can you be a uh, lethal enforcers too? <laughs> I don't think that's grammatically correct, and that certainly was a Final Fantasy XV Royal Edition. Not, can you be the Lethal Enforcers? Not, will you become Lethal Enforcers? What is a Lethal Enforcer, anyway? The game is set up into five stages, and while the game normally automatically takes you through them all one by one, this long player has some sort of level select cheat going on here. Thinking about it, there's no story beats separating them or anything, and their difficulty can be a little over the place, so going through them in a different order could potentially make for a more unique experience. This playthrough goes through the intended order, though. Starting with... Come on, Sheriff! Whoa, Whoa, the the All 
five stages have a similar setup. You're taken on a set path or a location, as all sorts of evil bandits, robbers, and criminals pop out of scenery or from off-screen. You want to shoot at them to take them out. Most bandits go down in one hit, while some take more and some take... a lot more. If you're too slow, they take a shot at you, which makes you lose a life, which are honestly more like health points than traditional video game lives in this one. You start a game with 10, but you can gain more by getting high scores, and of course, because this is an arcade game, by inserting additional quarters. These guys are hilarious. Not once do they ever think to say, sneak up behind you. Their singular strategy is to approach right into your line of sight, wait a few seconds, and then fire. Their death animations can be really hilarious too. For the enemies in this game, they decided to do that thing a few games did around this era where they would take video of real life actors in costume and then crunch them down to fit on screen as well as within the game's hardware space. From a technical standpoint, this method of video game graphics has obviously not aged the greatest, but I'd be lying if I said there wasn't some something endearing about the style, something nostalgic, if you will. This honestly surprises me, but this game does list each and every person who played the enemies in the credits, which, uh... It's about 40 names in all, which is way more than I expected. None of these names I recognize, though, lead me to believe that they might just be friends of developers or developers themselves that happen to be hanging around the office during development. I wonder if any of these people are still doing stuff nowadays. I always gotta wonder that when I see, like, a super old game have, like, a credit roll like this. <laughs> The bank robbery stage takes you through this entire old-school style bank. You got the exterior, multiple reception areas, I love this guy that pops out of the safe in the background, some offices, and then you blast back out to the exterior. This game does a really good job at accustoming you to its various mechanics. For example, while the goal of the game is to shoot people, every area is peppered with innocent citizens. <laughs> Either as hostages, folks just try and do their job, or my personal favorite, people who just walk in, get startled, then walk the fuck out. <laughs> no. Shooting them by accident makes you lose a life, the same penalty of being hit by anything else. They find some creative ways to subvert your expectations with these too. Sometimes a bad guy will enter the screen holding up their hands, saying a voice line normally only, only innocent people say or even disguises one before pulling a gun on you. And the nastiest subversion of this is, uh... This guy. Apparently, this is the sheriff. But wait, I thought we were the sheriffs. He has a gun almost every time he shows up, which might make you instinctively shoot at him, but doing so loses you a life the same as, as if you were to hit any of these other people. As a kid, my strategy to remember not to shoot this guy would be to recognize him as the only armed guy in the game that doesn't shoot in your direction. Another mechanic are these glowing weapons of a red outline that you can discover. They either drop from enemies or can be revealed by shooting at particular terrain and obstacles. These are the 50 caliber sharp, the rifle, the double rig, the shotgun, the gatling gun, and a cannon. <laughs> These aren't as useful as they sound, in all honesty. Their functions are about what you'd expect. Some shoot faster, but do lower damage. Some shoot slow, but do more damage. Although, given that most enemies die in one hit in this game, predictably a couple are just outright a bad idea to grab. Although, I always find myself picking some of them up anyway, because, like, the mental image of hauling a cannon through a bank is just too funny to me. Oh, and you also lose them if you get hit once, so it's not like you're going to have them for very long anyway. If I had to pick the best one, though, I'd say it's the double rig. What it does is it gives you two guns, essentially doubling your damage output without any penalty to your damage or fire rates. Eventually, we get to the boss of the stage, this giant man with three cannons, which he periodically fires at you from. The bosses in this game are really cool. The first thing you'll notice is that a lot of them are just big health sponges. Well, okay, I'll just shoot him nonstop, you say. Well, you could, but they're always firing right back at you. But unlike most enemies that just show up, shoot you, then disappear, these guys launch some sort of projectile at you that you have to shoot before it hits you instead. What this does is it essentially turns every boss into a complex juggling act where you have to manage projectiles on top of constantly keeping pressure on the boss himself. It's surprisingly fun for how simple these can be.
I love that every boss has some overdramatic death as well. Upon completing a stage, you get ranked on your accuracy and how few innocent people you may have accidentally killed. As far as I can tell, these ranks don't really do anything, but they're a nice bookend to each of these stages. And with that, stage 1 is complete. Our next level is... This stage is structured a bit differently in that instead of taking a trip through the stage's many areas, you're instead riding along a couple stagecoaches, presumably being hijacked. The bandits will ride in on horseback as well as pop out from behind the carriages. The first carriage itself is actually the least safe place to shoot around because the people inside, as well as the guy whipping the horses on top, all count as civilians. Occasionally, a bugler will ride by too, who you also can't shoot. This stage is very heavy in teaching you the importance of just not shooting everything you see. The stage also has, uh... Uh-oh. Oh, those are white men dressed inappropriately. Okay, so this is the other reason I didn't really want to just do a regular, imprudent playthrough of this game. There are Native American stereotypes in it. And they're exclusively portrayed as villains. They're not, like old-school, old-school, borderline dehumanizing depictions of them, but this game was still released during an era where most depictions of Native Americans in pop culture were still typecasted as morally gray, as if they were just as bad as our ancestors who completely decimated and disturbed their land and culture. Admittedly, this is the kind of topic that, while I believe myself to have morally good views on, I'm just not very knowledgeable in myself, so I'm not gonna- I'm not gonna dwell on them too much here. Now that I think about it, are these guys wearing sombreros and ponchos also offensive in a cultural appropriately kind of way? I don't know. All I know is that this is obviously the kind of thing that you wouldn't see fly nowadays. It is a blemish on otherwise near-flawless arcade experience to me, and it's something we're unfortunately gonna have to see a little bit more of before the end. Particularly this one one boss very late in that's a bit of a doozy in this regard, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. To get a little back on track, if you're wondering if they're mechanically different at all, they actually are. They don't have guns, but instead use a bow, and the arrows they shoot can actually be shot out of the air before they hit you. After about a couple minutes of this level, we get to the boss, which is a laughing jolly man holding barrels over his entire head before throwing them at you. You can shoot them as they tumble towards you, which is how you avoid taking damage during the fight. Admittedly, I actually see this as the easiest boss in the game. Like, I don't know, most of the projectiles go straight towards you, and it's not like there's much deviation on how he throws them. So, the juggling act you gotta do for this one is honestly just, like, line up your shot horizontally with him, then just go up and down accordingly. This entire stage might be the easiest, in fact. After hitting him enough times, he goes f And that's the end of stage two! Between this and the next level, you actually get a bonus stage where you shoot bottles, which is kind of fun. You mostly do it just for score, which in turn can get you more lives. And then you move on to... This stage starts with enemies already on screen, ready to fire at you. This stage is pretty fun. By this point, they sort of expect you to get the gist of how the game works, so the difficulty really begins to ramp up here. There's a lot of enemies popping up from behind counters, doors, and tables. This is also the first stage to introduce these women in dresses who look a bit like civilians at a glance, but actually pull a gun on you once they get a little on screen. Kind of the inverse of the sheriff, who looks like a bandit at first glance, but is actually a good guy. Did someone just catcall that lady walking by? I love that some of the enemies tumble down the stairs during their death animation. God, this game certainly has character. <laughs> Our trip through the stage actually ends up taking us outside the saloon, which is like... Why is this game called Saloon Showdown again? I swear, like, half of it doesn't even take place in this one. You, you just, like, go outside for the second half of it. This civilian that slowly walks in the background drinking whiskey is pretty funny. You, you can't shoot him, either. When we draw, start shooting. <laughs> The boss of the stage is really weird, though. Instead of a guy throwing stuff at you, it's these three guys challenging you to a quick draw challenge. 
You have to wait until they start pulling their guns before you can fire yourself, but you also have to be quick once they do, because if they hit you once, you have to redo this whole ordeal. Even if you already killed a couple, it's really weird and takes like 5 seconds once you do it correctly. It feels almost like a mini game that was put over a boss by accident. I don't know why, but I feel like I might even have some Mandela effect style memory loss regarding a boss in the stage originally. Like, I don't know, something about this whole this whole fight just seems very weird to me. Regardless, let's move on to stage four, which is let's run. This was actually my favorite stage in the game as a kid. It's just as that it's an auto-scroller, which, um... Actually, given the entire game is on rails, could you technically call the entire experience an auto-scroller? Eh, whatever. You start at the caboose of the train and slowly ride your way to the front, all while bad guys jump out and try to take pot shots at you from within the train. I think the thing that sticks out to me is... It's a lot more interesting than you would expect just a ride alongside a train would be. It starts pretty simple, with bandits and citizens appearing exclusively in the windows of the train, but they very quickly find ways to subvert your expectations in either funny or creative ways. And then they start to introduce in different types of rail cars as well. There's this one with an open top that's basically fair game for anyone. This one has a door swing open with a tied up guy inside, instantly adding a level of depth unique to the set piece. Things you'd think to be decoration explode open, revealing more bad guys. This one has a cow on it that cannot be harmed no matter how many times you shoot it for some reason. Like, I love the variety in this level. It's definitely the highlight of the game for me. The boss of this stage is simply chaotic, but in a fun kind of way. It's this crazy prospector guy throwing dynamite, and the battle involves him hopping all over the locomotive while doing so. Dare I say, I think this is the hardest fight in the game. The arc of the dynamite is lobbed at doesn't leave a lot of time to actually shoot them before they hit you, and he'll even double up as he throws them eventually as well. And it can lead to a long moments where you're spending more time avoiding damage than actually dealing damage. Although, to balance things out, I think he's the boss with the least amount of health in the game as well. And I also feel like he has less invincibility frames than most other encounters like this. It's a type of fight where win or lose, it's over very quickly, and it, it's kind of exhilarating as a result. After that, we have a fun distraction in the form of the game's second and final bonus stage, and then it's on to... Not even a minute in, we're introduced to a new enemy type, a guy who just hits you with an axe. This stage is all over the place. The term I would use to describe this stage is variety. It doesn't seem to have a common theme between all of its screens and set pieces aside from maybe the minecarts, which kind of works in its favor and to its detriment a little bit as well. It kind of gives the impression that you're wandering through an unknown area, which I guess makes perfect sense given this is the enemy hideout and you're not going to know it very well. Something else kind of confusing about this stage is it introduces a lot of enemies in new costumes and even palette swaps you don't see at any other point in the game. It can really make you second guess if someone is a citizen or not. You can't trust anyone. They could be a bad guy or you just shot an innocent victim by accident. This particular screen is really nasty. There's a citizen standing stationary in this cave, and enemies stand and walk by her in such a way that you practically need to graze them in order to kill them without killing her too. Since this game has a bit of a hit detection quirk that overlapping entities get hit at the same time, it's a fittingly tense final screen. And then we get to the final boss, who is, uh... Arise! Oh, that, that, that's even more offensive. So, the name of the game with this final boss is multitasking. You have this, uh, white man dressed inappropriately shooting fireballs? God, even as a kid, I thought this was just too ridiculous. He also summons skeletons. Said skeletons throw tomahawks at you. You can shoot the tomahawks away, and you can also defeat the skeletons themselves by shooting them. But you need to do so with a headshot, or else its head will fly towards you as yet another projectile you'll have to juggle. 
It's an extremely hectic fight, although you have a lot more time to shoot said projectiles, so I actually do find it a tad bit easier than the Stage 4 boss. As he gets closer to defeat, he'll begin to summon skeletons more rapidly until you deplete all of his health, at which point he'll, uh, turn into a skeleton himself. Also, this is technically the game's only cutscene, by the way. And then it cuts to the final scoring screen, and then the credits roll. Oh boy. So, again, this is a very nostalgic game for me. It's a... Uh, thank you, thank you, Creative Cloud. So again, this is a very nostalgic game for me. It's a... Uh, got some problems? I swear, why was that the final boss? <laughs> but overall, I think it still kind of holds up and has a unique charm to it that can still be appreciated today. So, something you might have been wondering this whole time is, if there is a Lethal Enforcers 2, then what is Lethal Enforcers 1? Let's go into that a bit. The original Lethal Enforcers was released two years before its sequel. It's another stage-based light gun arcade experience where you shoot bandits and criminals while avoiding shooting innocent civilians. Although the biggest difference is instead of playing in the Wild West, it takes place in modern day, or at least modern day at the time, which was 1992. And instead of playing as a cowboy sheriff, you play as a cop in the Chicago Police Department. And it's basically what you'd expect. It really does feel more or less like the same game, but with a more contemporary coat of paint, which is ironic considering that this one came first, but whatever. It's got a similar UI, like screen transitions, mechanics, special weapons. In both games, your default weapon is called the Justifier. Both games have bosses with similar structures. Both games have a couple stereotypy enemies. Both games have five stages with two bonus stages peppered throughout. Heck, the first stage of either game is even a bank robbery. The names of these stages, if you're curious, are this one and then Chinatown, an airport, a shipyard stage, which for some reason is called the drug dealer, and then ending with a chemical plant. I skimmed through the long play for my research here because I admittedly have never played this game growing up and honestly, it doesn't look as interesting as 2. The game is actually a little longer than its sequel, however, it pads out a lot of this time by slow auto-scrolling sections that pan back and forth. And this game indulges a lot more in enemy spam for some real artificial difficulty. A really good example of a quantity over quality experience. There were a couple memorable moments though. Like, during the first stage, there's a part where you're riding alongside some cars of criminals popping out of them, which I guess is a little similar to the stage code section in 2. Although, it's really funny here because there's like a dozen people inside these cars, and if you shoot the driver, the whole vehicle just careens off screen. There's also this section during the final stage where the lights go out, and you have to play the game in night vision mode, which is an interesting twist on the formula. The final boss is also pretty hilarious too, it's a guy in this giant attack helicopter you need to break individual parts off of before he flies inside the building you're in, and then it's basically a damage race from there. It's a fine game I guess, more or less your typical cop action thriller turned video game you saw all the time back in the 90s. The fact that its sequel takes place in the Wild West has some interesting implications though. There's no story ties between either of these games and barely a story at all, so my best assumption as to what's going on here is Lethal Enforcers is designed to be a series of light gun arcade games where each installment you take control of a different type of law enforcement throughout history. Kinda interesting, if that is what they were going for. If you are curious, there does exist a Lethal Enforcers 3, but there's even less information that I can find on this one. I can't even find English footage of it, despite the Wikipedia page saying it did get localized. From what I can take watching a long play footage of this one, you play it as yet again as a modern day cop, but this time in 2004 in Japan. It ditches the whole pre-renders actors aesthetic for the entire game being in 3D. Given the era, the graphics kind of remind me a little bit of true crime actually. Gameplay seems a lot different too. This one is yet again designed to be played of a second player, but there's actually a competitive aspect to this to it this time around, as both players are racing through the stage. Now, how does that work, you may ask? The entire game is on rails, right? Well, yeah, you are running at all times, after all. But there's this added mechanic where you can throw up a riot shield. This protects you from damage, but it also halts you in place, allowing your opponent to get ahead. It's a really interesting risk-reward mechanic that asks you to test how risky you're able to play. The game looks fine, I guess. It's got a couple interesting twists, though it is also missing a lot of the charm that made the original two so memorable. 
While the constant running is unique, staying in place for screens can really make them stand out in your mind, leading to the locations of this game blending in quite a bit. The bosses don't look that fun either. As for the new graphics, I have an issue with these two. Pre-rendered graphics do look pretty dated, but ironically these more modern blocky people can look even more dated, and it kind of doesn't help that so many games looked exactly like this around this era. Heck, the new graphics on top of the dynamic lighting can even make it a little hard to tell who's a civilian and who's not. It just looks a little difficult to play for the wrong reasons, though not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination. Let's talk about the music. The music of Lethal Enforcers 2 is really, really good. It's about what you'd expect for a game like this. It uses a lot of Western instruments and motifs that perfectly capture the feel of each of the situations they're played in. I want to say there's a little under 20 tracks in all, which is not bad for an amount for a game of this length. It does repeat some music on occasion, but I think even in those situations, the tracks used still match their areas pretty perfectly. To the point at which it feels more like an artistic choice than something they had to do due to constraints. My personal favorite song in the game is the theme that plays for the stage holdup in Train Robbery level, with the first theme of Bank Robbery and the second theme of Hideout being extremely close seconds. I feel like it'd be a little cliche to say this OST makes you feel like a cowboy or whatever, but it certainly has a very heroic feel to it. It's just great music for what it is. And the only theme I think is kind of bad to be perfectly honest is the bonus stage theme because it uh j just listen to this let's see if you got what it takes to be a show <laughs> The hell is this penis music? By the way, if you followed me for a while, you might actually recognize some of these songs as I used them in the first RPG Maker game I ever made, Tamer Island. Basically, I used a bunch of stage themes from this game as battle themes, and specifically, I used tracks from the Genesis version of the game. And I think that's a good segue to talk about the ports. So, there are three ports of Lethal Enforcers 2 to speak of starting with a release for the Sega Genesis, and my god, it is exactly what you would expect for a Genesis port of a 90s arcade game. The core of the game is still there, but everything is comically bit-crushed from the graphics to the audio to the voice lines, even more so than they are in the original game. It's kind of funny just to watch in action, you know? If anything, it is at least a little ambitious how rigidly they attempt to stick to how the original game functions. Tons of arcade ports around this time had to cut corners or tone down the amount of enemies or bonus visuals so it wouldn't lag. But none of that really happens here. They compromised only what they needed to to make this game work as intended on the Genesis. My absolute favorite thing about this port though is what they did to the music. Unlike all the other sound related things in this game that are heavily bit crush, the music instead feels heavily remixed if that makes sense. Although still pretty bit crushed. Specifically, it's almost as if they were changed in such a way to put more emphasis onto each song's melody. And this leads to an interesting scenario where there are some songs that I actually prefer in this version. Basically, the trade-off to them being the arcade music is cleaner and uses instruments that actually sound like instruments, while the Genesis soundtrack sounds more video gamey, I guess. It's pretty cool, I definitely recommend giving both a listen sometime and deciding which ones you like more. Particularly one I really enjoy is the boss theme, which is just pure chaos in a way that kind of reminds me of Akihata music. Speaking of 16-bit consoles, there was a Super Nintendo port planned at one point, Although, this was cancelled, so let's move on to the Sega CD version. God, you guys remember that console? The Sega CD is really weird. Anyway, this part is, again, kind of what you expect. Like the Genesis version, there are elements of this version of the game that had to be scaled down or bit crushed to fit within the console's hardware limitations. But obviously, being a more powerful console, they were able to get away with doing it way less. Particularly the most notable thing about this version is that it actually was able to keep all of the original music, since the console was able to do CD quality audio. 
though strangely the voice lines still feel pretty bit crushed, and on top of that, the graphics are still pretty downgraded overall as well, though not as much as they were on the Genesis. Something pretty different to this port and the next one is a pretty unique issue actually that both the Genesis version and the original didn't have. Load times. Yeah, screens have to individually load in now, which can be a little immersion breaking. And given this was a pretty early era CD console, some of the load times can get pretty lengthy too. Although aside from that, it's a pretty solid port. The next port actually isn't technically just a port of Lethal Enforcers 2, but instead a combo pack featuring both that and the first game for the PlayStation 1. And this port is pretty good as well. First of all, it's the only port to match the visual aesthetic perfectly with no compromise. The voice lines are one-to-one -one what they were in the original. The stage tracks are all their original versions. The graphics are perfectly represented here too, and if anything, they actually kind of look better here. I don't know why, but the image quality on a lot of these art assets are still pretty bit crushed, but are noticeably cleaner and sharper than they were in the original arcade release. Even the UI is a lot cleaner, using brighter colors and rearranging their elements slightly to make them more readable. There are two issues with this version, however, and these can be kinda deal breakers depending on the type of gamer you are. Firstly, remember how the Sega CD version had long load times? Well, they're back here too, since this is another disc-based console. And if anything, they're more immersion breaking this time around because they're accompanied by these ugly loading bars that don't fit the game's aesthetic at all. And secondly, the game feels faster. Like, I don't know, whenever I look up footage for this port, it always seems to be running about a quarter faster or something. This inevitably makes the game a lot harder, but could also make for a good challenge if you're up for it. Now let's take a look at the manual. So I was able to find scans of the game's manuals online for the Genesis and the CD ports, though not the PlayStation 1. Which kind of, which, well, even that kind of surprised me given how obscure these games are, although I'll only be looking at the Sega CD version here because they're pretty identical, but that one does have way better image quality and formatting to be perfectly frank. So, like I said at the start of the video, the name of your gun is canonically the Justifier, which is just a really funny name to me. And while these ports can be played of a normal controller, light gun options are available for them as well, although you gotta buy them separately. Also, the laundry list of how not to use them is pretty funny just to run through. Do not expose it to strong shots, do not bang it against things, don't touch the terminal, don't block its mouth, don't point it at the sun or dunk it in water, don't stick it in a burning attic, don't put it in an oven. Who's putting stuff like this in an oven? Don't point it at anyone, don't modify it. What does that even mean? <laughs> don't use the gun with a projection television set, a liquid crystal television set, a high vision television set, a wide vision television set, or a quote unquote older television set. What kind of TVs are left? I didn't even know there were this many, to be honest. Don't use the gun outdoors, you know, for those of you who take things literally when your mom said to play outside. Don't have fluorescent lights around when playing it. Don't use this gun with games it's not designed for. Don't use TV filters. And whatever you do, don't play with a mirror nearby. Or else the white men dressed inappropriately will emerge and fight you in real life. The rest of the instruction manual is kind of what you expect, to be honest. Like, it goes over the different weapon types, their intricacies, the different stages, a couple tips here and there. Oh yeah, there's also an ad for Contra Hardcorps and Sparkster, which are... not Sega CD games? God, the Sega CD had, like, nothing on it if they're advertising previous generation or console games on it, I swear to god. <laughs> Oh wow, remember gaming helplines as well? Remember when calling was charged by the minute? And while these scans don't show the back of the Sega CD instructions, the back of the Genesis one has a picture of Sparkster on it too, for some reason. Oh, but hold on! As I was writing this part of the video, I actually stumbled upon a third instruction manual for a version of the game. The original! Now, this one is kind of interesting though. It's an instruction manual for an arcade game, which means it's not designed for, like, kids or gamers to read. It's instead an operator's manual designed for people looking to purchase the game for their place of business that might not be familiar with games themselves. Although because of this, it's frankly 
not that interesting to read, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. It's a lot of corporate speak and schematics to, like, the innards of the machine um, and how to actually set it up and the like, but there is some interesting stuff in here. For example, it explains some of the dip switch options. You can set the game to progress through each stage in order as you play the game, or select which one you want to play at the start. Like, you, can, you basically just start the game with the stage select. Which actually explains that weird discrepancy I saw with the original long play I found for the game. It also recommends that you only use this option in any adult location. <laughs> Which obviously means basically if you're going to step in like a bar or something, but something about how that's worded is kind of funny to me. Like with every other one of these types of arcade games, you can adjust the difficulty to whatever you like, whatever you think would be the most profitable in other words. You have schematics on the innards of the machine. God, this looks complicated. I thought this was kind of weird. Despite the two guns used for the game being blue and red, the manual refers to them as blue and pink for whatever reason. And I'm gonna be honest, I've been scouring the internet for days here past that, and that was honestly the last interesting thing I was able to find. <laughs> Uh, even for as much as I'm interested here in this game, it is still pretty niche, all things considered, and the simple fact of the matter is that only so much information is going to be available. Like, even the cutting room floor had basically nothing on the game. Like, the title screen is different between North American and Japanese versions. It's also called Lethal Enforcers 2 The Western over there, which is kind of interesting, but that's basically it. There's like one line of dummy code there, too. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like I did my best here. It was fun to revisit this game again after all these years, and I hope you folks enjoyed this little deep dive. Okay, so before I move on to like the credits of the video, I want to address a bit of an elephant in the room here. What the hell took this video so long? What, it's been like six months and what you've been able to make in that time is a half hour review of a retro game no one's heard of? <laughs> like not even my three hour yik video took this long to make, I think. Well, yeah, I am very aware of the massive gap, and I apologize for that if you exclusively follow me for these longer videos. Basically, there's been two major things in my life that have happened that have sort of caused this. First off, I got a new job. To be honest, I feel pretty happy being at this job, all things considered. I mean, it's better than most places I've ever been at, although it does take up a lot of my time I used to have free to work on big videos like this. And secondly, I've been working a lot more on my game dev project recently, too. I mentioned this briefly in my yearly recap video from last year, but I've begun working on my own RPG Maker game for the first time in ages, and while I have been enjoying working on it quite a lot, that too has taken up a lot of my free time as well. So basically, I've begun to get to a point in my life where I need to start picking and choosing what I work on on a daily basis more carefully. Let's Plays are easy to record for me, and they perform consistently well. And my game dev project is new and exciting, and while we do also live in a capitalistic hellhole where you need a job to live, and given how time-consuming video essays can be for how poorly they can perform sometimes, it was sort of a natural thing to eventually start putting on the back burner, so to say. Not to mention I even had problems with this video a lot these past few months. There were weeks where I just couldn't find any information. I had a nasty computer issue at one point that actually corrupted the video, so I had to redo a bunch of it. It led to this originally simple video to just take ages to finish. I apologize to any of my fans who follow me exclusively for these, but for the time being, I guess expect less video essays for the foreseeable future for these reasons. I'll definitely be working on them for sure, but I doubt I'll ever get to that two-a-month consistency I had from last year. Oh, and I also promise that the game I'm working on will be more than worth it. Anyway, I'd like to give a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, P. Jammin, Sean, and Great Wolf. Thank you all again for your support, and I will see you folks next time. Thanks for watching.